Good evening. Um, I'd like to call the meeting to order. This is the April 28th, 2015 meeting of the Cape Elizabeth Zoning Board of Appeals. Uh, the first order of business is to approve uh, some minutes from prior meetings. Uh, first, we have the December 10th, 2014 uh, minutes. And uh, the only members of the board uh, who are present at that meeting and are still on the board and are present here are uh, Matthew and the two Michaels. Um, so, somebody like to make a motion? Move to approve those minutes. Or second. All in favor? So, three nothing. That's unanimous. And the December 10th, 2014 meeting minutes are approved. Um, next, to approve the February 24th, 2015 uh, zoning board meeting minutes. And um, that was the last meeting. Um, uh, do I have a motion to approve those minutes? So moved. Second. Uh, all in favor? All right. And so we have six nothing on those. Um, I do not believe there's any old business before the board, so we will just move right down to the new business, which is to hear an administrative appeal by Stephen and Jennifer Haynes of the Code Enforcement Officer's decision to require a vacant, non-conforming lot on 28 Woodlawn Road, tax map U01, lot 24C, to receive a private access way approval from the planning board prior to the issuance of a building permit. Um, and before I hear from the appellant, um, Ben, if you could just give us a quick summary of this uh, issue. Sure. Uh, this is a non-conforming lot in the RC zone. It is approximately 14,370 square feet. It has 40 feet, approximately 40 feet of street frontage on Woodland Road. On July 26, 2012, the former code officer uh, wrote a letter in response to a property owner's request and in that letter he stated that a private access way approval would be required prior to the building permit being issued. Uh, Mr. Haynes came and talked to me about the issue and we discussed different aspects of the zoning ordinance and uh, you know we realized that there is uh, that, that the zoning ordinance isn't crystal clear on this subject and uh, and so, he, you know, he, he stated that he did not think he needed a private access way permit based on section 19.43. And uh, that section conflicts somewhat with section 19.79, the section on private access ways. Uh, because there was a letter from the code officer in 2012 in that letter, uh, appeal rights were not written out in that letter. Uh, therefore, I think this request is timely, uh, but, but that was a formal determination by the code officer. And additionally, uh, there is past precedent that, uh, th for the planning board to review such lots for private access ways. Uh, I do think the lot is a, uh, is a buildable lot based on it, it is a legally non-conforming lot, which, which are allowed to be built on. Uh, the question is, does it first need a private access way approval from the planning board, or am I authorized to issue the permit based on section 19.43? Thank you, Ben. Sure. Um, as we can now hear from the appellant. Oh, good evening. My name is Bob Danielson. I'm an attorney in Portland, uh, and I live in Cape Elizabeth. And uh, I represent uh, Jennifer and Stephen Haynes. I brought Jennifer with me. Stephen's a uh, merchant marine, and he's out to sea right now, so he couldn't be here. Um, as a code enforcement officer stated, we're here for an interpretation of the zoning ordinance as to whether 
um, a building permit on this lot could be issued without the requirement of a private access way. Uh, and as the code enforcement officer also correctly stated, this is a legally existing non-conforming lot. The zoning ordinance addresses legally existing non-conforming lots in section 19-4 uh, and specifically vacant non-conforming lots in 19-4-3. If you look to the language of the ordinance, 19-4-3 governs the use and modification of non-conforming lots in all areas of the town except for shoreland performance and resource protection districts. This is not in either of those districts. This is in an RC district um, solely. 19.43 goes on to state that vacant lots may be built upon even though they do not meet the minimum lot area, net lot area per dwelling unit, street frontage or similar requirements as long as they meet the chart set forth below. And in my version of the ordinance, which I printed off just the other day, uh, that's on page 35. I don't know if you have a copy of the ordinance in front of you, uh, but there is a chart in, and it was, I think I attached it to my application, uh, a chart in uh, section 19.4.3 of the ordinance, which defines all of the requirements of a non-conforming lot uh, that the, the non-conforming lot must meet before you can issue a building permit. And in fact, just before the chart, it says, the code enforcement officer may issue a building permit and related permits and approvals for a principal structure and related buildings and structure that do not comply with the setbacks and other space and bulk standards that would otherwise be required in the district in which it is located. So it's taking into account that it's in an RC district as long as the following standards are met. Those standards are front setback, side setback, rear setback, minimum lot area, and it goes on to define whether it's with public sewage or without, maximum building coverage. And that's all the requirements of the non-conforming lot under section 19.43. So the applicant wants to design a building that would meet all those setback requirements and has now been told by the code enforcement officer that they need a private access way which does not show up anywhere under 1943 of the ordinance. So I took a look at how 1943 interacts with 1979C which is the private access way in the ordinance. First, under Article 4, case law has said that even though provisions permitting non-conforming uses are subject to strict construction, we must never lose sight of the other guideline to the legislative intent, to wit, it's an old case, unless inconsistent with the plain meaning of enactment, words and phrases shall be construed according to the common law meaning of the language. Statutes and ordinance should be read according to the natural and most obvious import of the language without, other, without resort to subtle or forced constructions for the purpose of either limiting or extending their operation whether, uh, where there is no manifest legislative intent otherwise. Uh, for the lawyers, that's Peace v. Folks in 1929. The reason I bring that up is the code enforcement officer mentioned in the past that the uh, private access way has always been the typical way that these have been reviewed. If you look to the language of the ordinance, I don't see a requirement that it be included. And just because it was done in the past doesn't mean it was correct. And looking to the ordinance, because the, the Haineses did make an application in 2012, in fact my office drafted it for them, and when it came back and said it needed a private access way, I spoke to them and they said, gee, I don't know if we can afford that right now. It, it doesn't make sense for us. Um, as the code enforcement officer also correctly pointed out, our rights were not barred at that point, so they decided to do nothing. They came to me recently and said, 
could you please relook at this? We'd really like to build our house on this back lot. So we went back and I said, gee, I really don't think that this private access way is required. So I also sat down with the code enforcement officer and we discussed it and you saw his letter which was in, my, in response to my letter. If you look at section seven, uh, I'm sorry, section um, 1979, that talks about tools that the planning board can utilize to assist further development in the town. It talks about a variety of different mechanisms for lots that may or may not meet the requirements. And it's very permissive, but it says, the purpose is to incorporate tools into the ordinance to better enable the town to implement its policies while respecting the rights of property owners. Well, this property owner has complied with the non-conforming section of the ordinance, which is totally exclusive of a private access way. There's no mention in this chart of private access ways or other requirements or go back to the space and bulk requirements of the section of the RC district. This non-conforming section of the ordinance is totally exclusive to non-conforming vacant lots. So there's nothing that, that cross-references. So when I look to section uh, Article 7, and I said, where, where are they going with this private access way? It appears to be that if the minimum street frontage on an otherwise conforming lot is not available, the planning board has the opportunity or the uh, ability to grant somebody a private access way to assist them in a, obtaining a building permit. It's not one of these cases where you shall do this. It says the planning board may. It says the planning board has the ability to allow. Those aren't obligatory. That's not obligatory language. It's not something where you're going to come in and say, you can't do this because you didn't get that. It says the planning board may allow this because it's going to help you facilitate your development. Okay. Um, Non-conforming lots do not need to meet the space and bulk requirements of Article 6. If you look to Article 7, Article 7 starts by saying, where you cannot meet the space and bulk requirements of Article 6, we are going to help you. So these sections are not inconsistent. They're mutually exclusive. One deals with non-conforming, one deals with the space and bulk requirements. So when you look at overlapping them, you're taking them in, out of context and basically doubling up on requirements. And don't forget, a zoning ordinance is police power. So where you look to a zoning ordinance, if it's not prohibited, it's permitted. There was a case, actually it, it is uh, Prentice versus Cape Elizabeth. 2003, and I don't think any of you were on the board at that time. It deals with a lot on Ocean Avenue, uh, which is down by Two Lights. And the entire case hinged on whether the language in the ordinance said that you must comply with sections two and three of the ordinance. And it was also a non-conforming law case. And section two and three of the ordinance basically had different requirements from each other. So what they meant to say was, you should comply with section two or three. And the ordinance was actually subsequently changed to include that. But the reason I bring all this up is, is that the court said, when interpreting the statute, the court examines the plain meaning of the statutory language to give effect to legislative intent and construes the language to avoid absurd or illogical results. Now, as I was going through this, I said, well, that's not really a case on point, but I'm going to mention it because Escape Elizabeth. And two, because you look at these two sections of the ordinance and you say, these two sections that we're looking at 
could overlap and apply. You could, you could apply all your standards to something, but the court said that's not what you should be doing. You should be looking to see if the uh, application applies to those portions of the ordinance that are applicable, and sometimes you're not going to have to double up. The final comment that the building inspector raised in his letter was that um, our section 943 and 1979C in conflict because they both require things relating to the, the driveways. And section 19-10-1 says that where their provisions are inconsistent, the more restrictive provision, more restrictive and specific provision shall apply. Code enforcement officer went on to state that he thought that section 1979C was the more restrictive. I respectfully disagree for the following reason. If you look at the two sections of the ordinance, I've said, and this is my primary argument, they are mutually exclusive. They're not inconsistent. The non-conforming lots are dealt with in Article 4. That's the whole purpose of Article 4. Article 7 is meant to be a planning board tool for, as I further said, places where the ordinance would otherwise allow a building permit, but for whatever reason, in this particular instance, frontage only, you wouldn't have that. So they can, they can continue to exist. They have different purposes. Article 4 is actually much more restrictive than Article 7 for the following reasons. Article 4 says that it shall govern the use and modification of non-conforming lots. A non-conforming lot may be built upon even though it does not meet the minimum lot area, net lot area, uh, street frontage, or similar requirements as long as the requirements of this, chap uh, this chart are met, and that's my chart on page 35. The CEO may issue a building permit for a structure that does not meet the setback and bulk standards that would otherwise be required in the district is located so long as the chart is met. They say that twice in the same chapter. In fact, if you look at the bottom of page 34 and the middle of page 35, it almost recites the same sentence. The reason that's important is it's telling you that it's exclusive. It says a building permit may be issued based upon the following criteria which are set forth in the chart. Section 1979C uh, is different. It allows the planning board to approve the development of an individual lot lacking required street frontage. The planning board may approve the creation and development of one lot if it finds the lot complies with the standards of section uh, 1979D4, which is a litany of sections. So the result of section 1979C is more onerous than the result of 1943. However, the impetus of 1943 is much more significant because if you look to main statutory law, and this is one MRSA, section 71-9A, shall and must are terms of equal weight and indicate mandatory duty or action. May indicates authorization or permission to act. Those are specifically set forth to allow people like you to interpret the zoning ordinance in that the stricter sections of the zoning ordinances are the ones with the shall, not the ones with the may. And clearly, a non-conforming lot has a lot of shalls in Article 4, and there's very few in Section 1979. Therefore, based upon the foregoing, the applicant or appellant requests that this board modify the decision of the code enforcement officer to remove any requirement that the appellant obtain a private access way permit prior to qualifying for a building permit. We're, we're here to answer any questions, and thank you. So here's where I'm struggling a little bit with argument, and maybe you can help me out. What, if I'm understanding what you're saying, it's that the provisions of Article 4 
provide and set forth all of the standards applicable to construction on nonconforming lots in that they provide space and bulk standards. And therefore, those provisions in Article 4 are mutually exclusive of the provisions in Article 7, which are entitled general provisions, which include provisions such as the one at issue for um, access ways, but also for corner clearances, off-street parking, dwelling, creation of accessory dwelling units, creation of temporary structures. So if we were to agree with your argument, my understanding is that construction on non-conforming lots would be subject to far fewer standards, just simple space and bulk standards, not even height restrictions, which all other normal construction in the Cape of, town of Cape Elizabeth is subject to. So that's what I'm struggling with in terms of your argument that those two are mutually exclusive. That may, excuse me, that may be correct, but I'm taking the ordinance at face value and I'm looking at Article 4 and Article 4 is telling me such things as the following provisions shall govern the use and modification of non-conforming lots. It doesn't say shall govern plus go back and find the space and bulk requirements plus determine whether you need to meet any of the requirements of Section 19.7. 19.7 clearly states at its outset, these are tools to assist the planning board where there may be otherwise problems. We, and uh, section 7.9 says right in its preamble that these are where they don't meet the space and bulk requirements of Article 6. Article 4 says you don't even get to the space and bulk requirements of Article 6. You stop at this chart on page 35 and meet a front yard, set yard, a front yard, side yard, rear yard, uh, minimum lot coverage. That's it. So you're conceding that if we were to agree with this argument, that all that would be necessary for construction on a non-conforming lot is compliance with the simple space and bulk standards that are in Article 4. That is all the ordinance requires. How do you explain the, the reference actually in 19.4 uh, to 19.6 standards? Which, which sentence are you referring to? We're looking at the, you're looking at the chart and yep. in the RSC districts you'll see yep. that there is reference in fact yep. to the 19.6 standards. Nope. Not that, on, that on the section, front setback. That section right here says with respect to front setback for principal structures you've got a uh, and with an, in an RC district, you've got to comply as required by section 1963E as to front setback, not as to all standards, not as to private access ways, not as to driveways, only as to front setback. There's nothing else. So if I, if I meet my front setback, which I take from the chart in 1963E, and I have a 10-foot side setback and a 15-foot rear setback and 10,000 feet with uh, public sewerage and a maximum building coverage of 25 percent, I get a building permit. But clearly, there is a reference right here in 194 to 196. So only, they're, not, they're not mutually exclusive, as you can argue. They are. Only as to the front yard setback. If the front yard setback is determined according to 1963, all of the other requirements are not applicable. Well, doesn't that make uh, for looser standards with respect to even these space and bulk standards? For example, if you look at 19.6, there is a maximum building height standard. There is no maximum building height standard in 19.4. So could your, could your client build a 100-foot building under your argument. The zoning ordinance has to be read according to what the zoning ordinance says. The code enforcement officer is certainly entitled to interpret that. If it has no maximum height restriction in the non-conforming lot section, maybe the zoning ordinance has to be changed to address it. 
You're aware of the long-standing body of case law stating that the role of zoning, one of the primary roles of zoning is to work to eliminate nonconformity. Absolutely. And you're aware that one of the primary reasons that ordinances contain provisions regarding nonconformance is to be very specific regarding the instances in which they may be allowed. Mm -hmm. And it is a general principle of ordinance construction, in my experience, that provisions in the nonconformity section are supplemental to the other provisions of the ordinance, particularly where those provisions are labeled general provisions applicable to as the planning board may see fit and as the town may see fit. Then why does section 1943A1 say the code enforcement officer shall issue a building permit, blah, 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 as long as the following standards are met? Issue a building permit does not say that he should then go back and determine whether it complies with the balance of the ordinance, does not say that it has to meet other requirements of the ordinance. It says the code enforcement officer may issue a building permit if, and the standards are set forth very simply. So, so you're arguing that they could build under this, under our ordinance, under your argument, they could build in a hundred story building on that lot. I have no idea whether they could build 100 stories. I'm not asking you're saying for 100 it wouldn't be stories. You're saying, only, you're saying the only requirements for that building are set forth in 1943-1A. That's what the ordinance says. I'm not interpreting it. I'm reading. Okay. Sorry, Chair. Uh, point of clarification, Chair. You're suggesting that this interpretation would allow further nonconformance. Correct. Any other questions for now? I had a follow-up point. Um, just for clarification purposes, could you help me understand the, uh, how you, your client is standing to bring this particular action today as to what happened in 2012? In w the lapse of time, and what is new in this current process that would allow you to have standing? Okay. We inquired of the building uh, code enforcement officer in 2012 what requirements would be necessary to build on this lot. We made an informal request. Here are some facts. Can you please interpret these for us and help us determine what we need to do? He sent us back a letter that said, here's the answer to your questions. He did not say, this is my decision and these decisions are binding, and you have 30 days to appeal. So we basically uh, cataloged that letter, didn't do anything, weren't required to do anything, weren't required to appeal, weren't required to do anything. We now are completing the process, which we're totally leg within, legally within our rights to do, and we brought the same argument back based upon our interpretation of the ordinance, Code enforcement officer sat down with me and, and reviewed everything and said, you know what, I think you're entitled to continue your application. And now he said, but I'm going to ask you to make it formal, which we did, and I'm going to ask you to, if I have a determination that it's binding, which we agree, and now we brought an appeal of that decision within the 30 days we were allowed to. Thank you. Good question. <clears throat> um, could you give me an example of, of a situation where uh, the private access way standards would apply? Would? If I have a, uh, a lot that otherwise meets the zoning requirements but has uh, a shortage of frontage because there's either been an eminent domain or some other third party circumstance where I don't have sufficient frontage. So non conforming? It's not, it, not necessarily. It could be non conforming, but it's not necessarily non conforming otherwise. And there are, there are many instances where you'll have a lot of that size. Any further questions for Attorney Danielson at this time? 
right. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Uh, would anybody else like to comment or present on this matter? Sir, can you submit it? No, sir. Can you state your name and um, yep. uh, and what this document you just passed out? This is um, just to help you follow the points that I'm trying to make. It's unlikely to be part of the record because that's it's perfectly fine. fine. Yep, does, does not have to be. Yep. No, it's just talking points. Um, my name is Brad Norris. Um, I live at 26 Woodland Avenue, uh, Woodland Road, um, right behind the property. Um, and this is hard because we've been we've been good neighbors with the Haynes. Uh, I'm the person that's maintained the property beside my house, um, which this access way would go on to. I've um, been doing it for several years ever since I lived there. Um, but when I bought the house, um, I looked at it. I looked at the, the ordinances, and as far as I was concerned, it wasn't a buildable lot. And that's one of the reasons I bought the property, was that I assumed it wasn't buildable. It, in fact, that property was attached to my property at the time, same owners. And I declined to purchase it because I said, Nobody's going to be able to build on it anyways. Um, doesn't really have a lot of value. Maybe in a few years when I have a little extra equity, I'll approach the owners and say, I'll buy it from you just to have, have it there. Because there was serious interest at the time to, to keep it forever wild. Um, I actually met with uh, Steve Haynes at one point, and he told me that the neighbors were talking about getting together to buy the lot to keep it forever wild. Um, I said I would be extremely interested in participating with that. Um, Unfortunately, the next thing I knew, he bought the lot. Um, I have no idea whether he bought it at, uh, as a non-buildable lot, and now he's trying to make a serious profit on it, or whether he paid the price of a buildable lot. I have no idea. Um, but this is, uh, that, that's the history of, of my property. Um, so I went through and I researched it. And by the way, I, I don't know any place in the world where you get to pick and choose the codes that you want to follow. Um, as far as I'm concerned, code is code. Um, I work in the fire protection business and we follow codes every single day and every code in that code book applies to my projects. Um, and so I've, I've never seen somebody go through and say, well, no, that doesn't apply. Um, so I went through and I, and I looked at code article one, uh, the scope and purpose of definitions. And for 19-1-2, it clearly states to prevent overcrowding of real estate, to promote a wholesome home environment, to conserve natural and cultural resources, to enhance the value of property. I went to Article 7, 19-7-1, that the attorney referenced so often, and the intent of that is to preserve open space and rural character. Then I went to Article 4, non-conformance, and it said the intent of this ordinance is to promote land use conformance. This is not a conformance. This, is, this building would be in the backyards of 11 different properties. Show me where else in the Cape, Cape Elizabeth you see something like that. And why do I bring all that up? Is because when you get to Article 5, Zoning Board of Appeals, under powers and duties, it says that they can grant variances from the terms of this ordinance, provided that there is no substantial departure from the intent of the ordinance. Well, I just read you what the intent of all those ordinances are, and it seems to me to go smack in the face of what the intentions of those were. Uh, then as we get into that same section, 19-5-2, the granting of a variance will not produce an undesirable change in the character of the neighborhood. Anybody that's been in this neighborhood will tell you it would totally change it. When I first moved into that house, I remember waking up the first morning and saying to my wife, listen, and she said, what? Children out playing out in that property. It, it, it really is, it's, it is an absolute resource to our neighborhood. It goes on to say well, it will not unreasonably detrimentally affect the use or market value of budding properties. Really? You don't think my property value isn't going to decrease substantially once, once the house is in, in my backyard? Or eliminating the privacy of an adjoining property without an effort to mitigate the lost privacy. 
we're going to be looking out our back windows, right into their windows. I don't know what plans have been made to mitigate privacy. Now, as we get back to Article 7, General Standards, 19-7-1, and this is where I would disagree with the attorney, because he kept saying that these tools are to assist. He said it four different times. No, read it. These tools are designed to achieve these goals while respecting the rights of property owners. That's all property owners, not just the ones going for the variants. And the tools are helped to design them, not to assist them. Then we get another section 19-7-9 under private access ways. This section allows the planning board to approve the development of an individual lot lacking the required street frontage if adequate access is provided to the lot. The development is carried out in a manner that minimizes the impact on adjacent properties and is consistent with sound neighborhood development. There's absolutely no way this is consistent with sound neighborhood development. Then, then I reference, uh, and, and this will be an issue once they try to build, the Code of Maine Rules, OSASH, 06-096 from the Department of Environmental Protection. It says that any grading of the construction activity in the site will cause no unreasonable alteration of natural drainage ways. I only have three copies of these. The first two photographs show the how the uh, I'll slide them down. Okay, great. Thank you. The first, the first two photographs show steep and fine from all the other property owners that go down on this property. The third one was taken just last week. I don't possibly see how they can create natural drainage off of that property. It just is not going to happen unless it means suddenly now all our basements are going to start being flooded. Where is that water going to go? Other questions need to be answered. Is Highland Road a paper street? There was a development built many, many years ago that had a road which, where this access way would be built. Actually, I can show you. It comes right down from there. I have here maps of the of that development when it was done, which clearly shows that it's there. I'll gladly pass that out later on. Um, and everybody I've talked to in Cape Elizabeth has said, Cape hasn't given back any paper streets. So how did it suddenly no longer become a paper street? Um, this has got to be, a, this question absolutely has to be answered before any permits can be given. Um, as far as I can see, it is. I know that they're claiming that they got clear title to it, but. Mis mistakes are made on title searches all the time. That's why they encourage you to buy title insurance. Um, what about the sewer system? Can it even accept it? Uh, most of my neighbors have had raw sewer back up into their, into their basements over the years. Um, can it take another home? Who covers the cost of the fails? And what about the sewer lines that are going to run under this access way right now? That's why, what I thought was a paper street. Everybody thought it was a paper street. In fact, the Haynes thought it was paper street because on July 13th, 2012, they sent a letter stating that they would like to, that they would like to use the paper street. Um, that was later rejected. I don't know where the change happened. You know, as far as, as, far as what the attorney arguments are, it's a silly notion that in order for code to be enforceable, it must be repeated in different sections. That's one of the things he said in his letter. Um, once again, do they really think they can go and cherry pick the codes they want to do? Our code enforcement officer recognized that it was obvious it would need an access way and that that would also have to be met. What good would a building permit do without that access way? So in conclusion, this project goes directly against the intentions of the codes. It would create overcrowding of real estate. It would be unlike almost any other property in Cape Elizabeth that is totally non-conforming. It would take away open spaces and destroy rural character, it would destroy a natural and cultural resource. It would completely change the character of the neighborhood forever. It is anything but sound neighborhood development. It destroys the privacy of every abutting neighbor. It reduces the value of the property of every abutting neighbor. And is doubtful the developed property could ever achieve natural water drainage without adversely affecting neighbors. Uh, and then, of course, serious questions about whether or not the sewer can hold up. I, I wasn't able to get any answers to that this week. 
Uh, it obviously going to take, you know, when you see those pictures of the water, standing water, there's obviously going to take extensive engineering studies before any permit should be issued. And by the way, all these codes were in place when that property was purchased. If they didn't research it, then I really feel bad if they, if they paid the full price. Truly, um, I do. Um, but they were there. I know I researched it before I even thought about putting an offer in, and I, I assume they would have as well. Um, Mr. McDougall uh, is working in the best interest of the majority of property owners, not just one. They are indeed using the tools provided to them to make sure that the codes are followed and this project is done correctly, and nothing is done until that's been assured. Projects like this are exactly why codes are written, and they're not written to just rubber stamp them to everyone who applies. Um, that's about all I have to say. Do you have any questions for me? So from your testimony, you're saying that you were adverse to this application? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> um, I just wanted to clarify a point that you mentioned that the, the, the lot is not buildable. I don't, we have two, one determination and one uh, letter from the previous code enforcement officer suggesting that it is a buildable lot. So that is uh, an issue. So. Mm. When you make the comments, that, 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 that's the clarification I want to make on, on that. Um, well, you. you know, when, when I see the, the reason we write these codes in the first place is to prevent something like this from happening. So when I see that it's in the code, that it doesn't meet the, re the frontage, then I just assume they've got to go get a variant in order to do that and that a process like this would occur. And it, and it has. And so I'm very happy with that. And when you originally looked at purchasing the property, on the map that's in front of the lectern there, what piece were you looking to buy? Oh, I, I would want the entire thing if I was going to What is the entire thing? It's this. There are two deeds this, that are part of this application. Correct. This is, this is my property here. Yes. Right, so at the and time. I would want any part would have had value split up because the other ladies wanted some of that portion. I would have taken the portion. My query is yep. at the time of considering the purchase in the property, was it always considered two pieces, prop two deeds, or it was the larger piece behind the homes that you were considering purchasing? I, I do not recall that. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank, Thank you. you much. Any other public comment? Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is uh, Mark Mercero, and I live at uh, 17 Charles Road. Um, and uh, I'm uh, one of the property owners uh, with my wife, Marie, that abuts the south boundary of the property in question. Uh, first, I have to say I d do not relish speaking in opposition of a, neighbor, a neighbor's plans or desires. Um, and the re reason I choose to rise up tonight and speak was to uphold the zoning intent, uh, intent for my family, my neighbors, and future inhabitants of the Charles Road, Woodland Road neighborhood. And I've, I've always looked upon myself, when I find myself in these beautiful settings, I lived in Newport, Rhode Island also, as, as a steward of the place where I'm, where I'm living. I believe that granting this variance would lead to a built to building a house uh, on the lot in question, uh, or I, I believe that building that allowing the, the variance, which would lead to the building of a house in this property, would violate the intent of Ordinance um, Article 4, Nonconformance 19 4, in five ways um, cause overcrowding of real estate, destroy natural resources, take away the open space and rural character, reduce the market value of abutting properties, and eliminate the privacy of an adjoining property. And further, it was my belief that my neighbors, including Jen and Steve Haynes, shared a vision of using this common lot for, for a play area for children, a, a buffer for peace and quiet, and a common space for neighbor, neighborhood activities. And we'd spoken about it um, at neighborhood get-togethers. And so it's that vision that's sort of reflected in the intent that I believe that's in the, the Cape Elizabeth Cape Elizabeth as zoning ordinance that I, I would like to preserve. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. 
I'm Marie Mercero, Mark's wife, and at, also at 17 Charles Road. Just to be clear, this is our property, which was a good part of the Haynes property, and is in a neighborly fashion, we just like to see the value of the property maintained. I think when you look at buildings on a structure, you have to say, is that going to be detriment to the community or is it going to enhance? And I certainly think in this case it will not enhance it at all. And I think it will bring the value of our property down as well as all the other abutting properties. So um, I do, I am adverse to having this built. Any other public comment? Hi, uh, my name is Derek Converse. I'm at 11 Charles. Um, I think uh, Brad and, and Mark and Marie uh, have already kind of touched on everything. There's just a couple things that are concerning for me, like um, Brad had mentioned. The lot is essentially the low spot between all of the properties surrounding it. So drainage and grading is a major concern. There, there are definitely times when there's some minor flooding that occurs in some of those areas. So off-site drainage issues, those would be big concerns if they have to build it up or however they handle that. Um, the other thing is, again, like, like uh, Brad said, you know, this is built in everybody's backyard. Literally everybody's backyard will be facing this property. And obviously that's... Um, a concern, you know, we, and it's, we're looking downhill onto it, so it's one of those where everybody's backyard looks downhill onto a house, and so I, I, I don't know if I can say much more than what they said, but I just, you know, this is hard for me too, because I, I, I do like Steve and Jen, and um, I certainly don't like confrontation, but uh, this is, um, I'm, I'm opposed to this. So thank you. Thank you. Any other public comment? My name is uh, Dave Connor. I live at 13 Charles Road, which is um, opposite. So it's hard for me. Um, my parents bought our, the house that actually I reside in now back in 1979. Um, uh, I was the last house on the road, so I've seen a lot of change. Uh, in fact, Mark and Marie's house and uh, a couple of the neighbors um, built, and it was a, a bit of mess with that development too. And to see this last bastion of woods go, um, it's unfortunate because I have a relationship with uh, the Haynes's too. Um, our children, our friends, um, you know, we all live in pretty close proximity, um, and I too, like many others, don't relish confrontation. Um, and and my pleas are certainly. Um, mostly emotional <clears throat> versus practical. I mean, all the practical um, issues that have been stated um, are concerns, property value, um, drainage, um, general aesthetics. Uh, but I suppose mostly for me, the hardest part is watching that last little bit of neighborhood um, forever change and just not knowing what that will, um, you know, what that ultimately will look like. Uh, and. You know, some of the factors brought up with the nonconformance, I guess I didn't recognize either that that could affect just exactly what could be built. Um, you know, um, again, it's hard to imagine the woods being anything more than they are now. And, um, you know, I'm an aesthetician, I would say, to a degree. And um, I will look, my kitchen will look directly out on whatever is there. Uh, and so that's just, it, the whole thing is a concern, a little sad. Um, for me, so um, that's really all I have to say. <clears throat> Thank you. Any other public comment? Well, I'm uh, me, Peter Eastman of 24 Woodland Road. Uh, I think it would be a shame to put another house in there. It is a good little open space. Uh, the kids have enjoyed playing back there and uh, shortcutting through that area and probably coming home with poison ivy. Uh, <clears throat> if you go taking a look at it, I suggest that you be prepared for that. 
I doubt if it would really bother me much at uh, having turned 88. I don't think I'll have to put up with any noise or inconvenience back there for very long. But uh, I think it would be, it's, it's a nice little spot to leave bare. That's one of the things about Cape Elizabeth. <coughs> uh, my farm, Turkey Hill Farm, out by Shore Acres, I have put in the conservation easement so it will not be built a pond. And a matter of fact, I'm in the process of giving the whole shebang to the Cape Land Trust to be used for someone as it is now with cultivating community and farm camp, but as a 25 acres for eternity to be used for the public interest out there. I think this little plot behind my house there and all these other people's houses could just as well stay as it is and be sort of a little asset. As a matter of fact, when I saw the sign go up, I thought, well, I ought to get the neighbors together and uh, come, come talk to, uh, what's the name, upstairs and find out what the property's worth and perhaps gang up together and buy the property and put it into conservation easement. But as with a lot of things, uh, things happen tomorrow and tomorrow may never come. But uh, I hope that they'll not build on that little thing. I, I thought there was a, a right of way into the property as it was beside the uh, 26. I'm surprised to hear some much discussion about access because the uh, I forget the name of the predecessors in there. Do you happen to know who the previous people were? Hanson. Hanson, yeah. I knew it began with H, but all I could come up with was Hannigan, and that was another neighbor in Massachusetts. So I, I hope that uh, one way or another, it'll stay as is, poison ivy and all. Thank you. Any other public comment? Attorney Danielson, would you like uh, some time for rebuttal? Um, yes, briefly. Uh, reference was made to a uh, public way or Highland Road that runs across the street. And we reviewed with the city, or with the town, and in the Registry of Deeds, and did a complete title of this. The, city, the town of Cape Elizabeth never acquired any rights in that road. However, the lots that were created on Woodland Road were created pursuant to a plan. The plan was uh, drawn up and recorded in 1898. That plan provides that everyone on that road has the rights of a private lot owner to use that road as laid out on the plan. The main law also provides that the owners that have the right to use that road can continue to use that road, including putting utilities down that road. So my client plans on using their portion of that road as a driveway, and there will be no construction on the part that is still the private way. But they're certainly entitled to use that portion of the road for their purposes consistent with our application. So I just wanted to clarify that there are private rights, no public rights, uh, and the use of the road by the Haineses will be consistent with, with the private rights of others. Thank you. Can I ask just oh, a quick question? Sure. So what you're saying is that all of the owners in that lot, in that neighborhood, have similar rights in that access? Any, any neighbors that had their lot uh, laid out as shown on that 1898 plan have certain rights in that road and we're not impeding on those rights. Mm -hmm. But that would be open to decision by someone other than us, certainly. That's, That's correct. That's not something That's that correct. we would decide, but certainly a court and could determine the scope of everyone's rights in that access. Right. And, and I hope the board bears in mind that we're here for the very narrow issue of asking whether the driveway to this otherwise buildable lot requires a private access way. Thank you. Um, I just want to follow up a point. Does that mean that if you put in the private access, yes, please, the access way, that means the other people that have rights to it are obligated to pay for some of the costs for the access right? Oh, if it was only true. <laughs> no. If, if you improve a private access way, which you're entitled to do, you have to bear the cost. 
But the it's not town property. The town has no responsibility. It's That's just not. and the person who the, the person of interest chooses to make an access way fronts the cost. That's correct. Even though the other people have a right, they they have the right to continue to cross it, and we can't impede that right. But if we choose to improve it now, there is statutory reference that says we don't even need to own it to improve it. However, my client does have fee title to that 40 feet of frontage on Woodland Road. And according to Maine law, statutory Maine law, they can improve that road to the extent necessary to bring utilities and a driveway down to their house. Thank you. Thanks. Any other questions? But so could all the other easement holders, right? That's right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any further public comment? Okay. Um, now move to the board discussion portion. Uh, I guess before we get into the substantive issue, does anybody want to discuss standing? I know Matthew had at least raised it um, during the presentation. Uh, I, it's it's jurisdiction for me. So I see the 2012 letter as merely um, not a conclusionary basis. It could have been well, better drafted, but that's just one of those things. Um, the applicant was now on, on notice. I suspect that a fee was paid uh, if there was a fee required for this to come before us. Um, so I'm, I'm content with the issue on standing. Everybody else? Just, OK. Um. Anybody like to start the discussion on the substantive issue at hand? Any initial thoughts, inclinations in one direction or another? I'm troubled with this interpretation um, because it, I, I they see it as a potential, theoretical anyways, of creating more nonconformity. And that, that's troubling. Um, uh, I take Stanley's point that there's a reference, a parallel reference in that section. The language doesn't, uh, it's not consistent, but uh, to interpret one way makes it uh, not absurd, but really peculiar results could, could result. To my mind, it's totally inconsistent with the ordinance to interpret the ordinance to state that all that new construction on a non-conforming lot has to comply with is the space and bulk requirements for non-conforming structures. No height restrictions. You can put as many principal buildings on there as you want because those principal, the number of, the limit on the number of principal buildings on a lot is also in the general standards. You can have whatever you want for access. <laughs> you can have whatever you want in terms of accessory buildings. This makes no sense to me. No road frontage and no, no real no. low rights to even right. use the road. Right. I, I tend to agree. The title of Article 7 is General Standards, which seems to me to, by its very nature, mean that it applies to everything that is in there, including non-conforming structures, which are, by their very definition, supposed to be held to the highest High standards. standards. Sorry, non-conforming lots. All non-conformities. <clears throat> Wouldn't they, so looking at uh, section 19 4-3 where it says vacant non-conforming lots may be built upon in conformance with the provisions of the district in which they are located doesn't that uh, wouldn't that bring in some of those uh, general standards it would bring in the height standard which, are, which is in the RC zone but it wouldn't pull in necessarily the general standards Because those aren't district based. They're kind of for everything. For everything. Yep. I mean, it sounds like we're all safely leaning toward the conclusion that section 19-101 does in fact apply and that the, the provisions here 
interpretation is so wildly inconsistent with so many provisions of the ordinance that we couldn't really possibly apply. I, I am having some trouble with section, maybe it's just the wording of 1979, private access ways. It talks about how the planning board may approve the creation or development on a lot lacking frontage. But I'm having trouble with what triggers planning board review for a lot like this. If they submit an application for private access, that jurisdictional pathway opens, and there's a full hearing and process by which that happens. And then if that process is approved, um, and a building permit is required, my understanding is and another application is submitted to the CEO for a determination. So, I mean, would, so would 1979C private access ways always apply when you're looking to build on a non-conforming lot? Only if it was non-conforming with regard to street frontage? With, re with regard to street frontage. So effectively, this is not their only bite at the apple. They can go back to the, if we oh, yeah. deny this, they can go to the planning board, fix the, uh, the, the frontage and then come back and apply for a permit. They just have to apply for a private access way permit from the planning board. That's the fix here. They were, they were applying to the, to the code enforcement officer saying, just give us a building permit with no planning board approval. And the building inspector said, no. well, we think that you need a public access way permit from the planning board. And so they're coming to us saying, do we or don't we? And certainly the planning board has the jurisdiction to assess um, the original plan of 18 whatever and also take account of the abutting neighbors and their concerns and perhaps require anything else that needs to be done. Yeah, I, I just want to point something out to the, the public. I heard several times uh, reference to a, a variance and we may be granting a variance tonight. That's, that's in fact not what is happening. We're, we're looking at what standards may apply, and uh, if we determine that the private access way standards do apply, it'll go to the planning board uh, if the applicant chooses to pursue that. Uh, so we're not, but, well, we, I appreciate the concerns about uh, whether or not it's appropriate to build on this lot um, for environmental reasons or for just general uh, you know, health of the neighborhood. Um, that's not necessarily what we're looking at tonight. Any other comments or discussion? Uh, would somebody like to make a motion? speak at once. I move we uphold the April 1st, 2015 Code Enforcement Officer decision to require a private access way permit prior to issuance of a building permit for this project. Second. Any discussion? Sorry, clarifications. It's perhaps um, you have to apply to the planning board. And then it's for the planning board to determine whether there is a permit to be issued. Is that correct? So I would. I was thinking that we're um, making a conclusion before a set of circumstances have been submitted to the plan planning board. Well, we're hearing an appeal of the code enforcement officer's decision that it had to go to the planning board for a private access way permit, and so my motion was that we find that we uphold his decision that that does have to happen okay so any any discussion on this motion i have my piece all in favor
So we've got six in favor. Or, oh, you are in favor. Sorry. In favor of the motion. Motion, yes. So that's seven. So uh, seven in favor. Uh, so it passes unanimously. Um, I'll go forward and read the findings of fact. <clears throat> This is an administrative appeal of the Code Enforcement Officer's decision letter dated April 1st, 2015, regarding a non-conforming lot at 28 Woodland Road, map U01, lot 24C. The applicants are Stephen and Jennifer Haynes of 31 Warren Avenue. Stephen and Jennifer Haynes agreed in 2013 to combine lots 24C and 24D into one non-conforming lot, map U01, lot 24C. The subject lot is in the RC zone. It is approximately 14,370 square feet, and it has approximately 40 feet of street frontage. On July 26, 2012, Bruce Smith, while acting as the code enforcement officer, wrote a letter in response to a request from Stephen and Jennifer Haynes' attorney, stating that a private access way permit is needed from the planning board prior to a building permit being issued because the lot does not meet the minimum street frontage requirement in the zoning ordinance. On April 1st, 2015, the present code enforcement officer <coughs> upholds the former code enforcement officer's decision to require a private access way permit prior to the issuance of a building permit. I have a clarification. Um, I think the 2012 is not a decision. I, I if that's a um, So let's say that um, oh, it should not be interpreted as a decision. So let's change. So just in, in number six, on April 1st, 2015. Decision to letter. The present code enforcement officer upholds the former code enforcement mm -hmm. officer's interpretation. No, sir. Reiterated? Re I don't know. Re or should we just say decided? So yes, there yes. would be a fresh, ass yes, yes. fresh assessment. <clears throat> so that last one um, that begins on April 1st is now going to read, on April 1st, 2015, the present code enforcement officer decided, decided, to, yes. des decided to require a private access way permit prior to the issuance of a building permit. Uh, conclusion. So we're going with option. Two, based on section 19-7-9C, the applicant is required to obtain a private access way permit from the planning board prior to the issuance of a building permit. And the decision is to uphold the code enforcement officer's decision dated April 1st, 2015. Um, and again, in terms of the findings of fact, um, all in favor of the findings of fact. Seven, nothing. Um, thank you for your time. Uh, next order of business, any communications for the board? <laughs> Somebody like to move to adjourn? So move. Second. All right. We are adjourned. <laughs> <laughs>